let's continue with let's continue with uh, let's continue with how the internet protocol works What we finished on yesterday was that we have an internet is made up of different subnets. In this example, we have a general internet where we have multiple subnets, hosts, the end user devices are hosts, they are attached to subnets, subnets are connected together via routers. So that's the concepts we know so far. We Yesterday looked at finished by looking at different ways to manage the routing table. The first approach, which we've covered in previous lectures, is we only store the next hop in the path, not the entire path. And two other approaches we looked at yesterday, we don't have to inst we don't have to store routes to every host. We can store routes to a particular network. That means we can deliver the datagram to a network and the final router attached to that network will then deliver to the destination host. So from this host perspective, if it wants to reach the destination, in fact, it needs to get the datagram to subnet Z. Once it gets to this router, then this router would deliver to the final destination. So in fact, the routing tables, we don't need to store the entire set of hosts in subnet Z in these previous routers. We just need to store a, a path to reach the entire subnet. Because the path to reach from this node to reach anyone on this subnet should be the same. If the path to reach this host is the same as the path to reach another host on this subnet. So we use network-specific routing, which makes the routing tables more manageable. And finally, we can have default routes. That is, you have specific routes, and then for all other networks and all other hosts in the internet, you may have one route. The default router is, say, the next router in your path. These make routing much more scalable within the internet. Let's go through an example that illustrates both the routing but also the flow of the data through an example. My example is very similar to this slide where we have a source host, a destination host, and three routers. In fact, in this slide it says we can have n routers. In general, in a path, there may be multiple routers in here. But for a specific example, let's say we just have our three routers. Let's give them some name so we can refer to them. Host 1 wants to communicate with host 2. Each of the devices, both hosts and routers, have routing tables. And let's call, although I've drawn a link here, this is a subnet with just a single link. And as we've so shown here, this is subnet A, B, C, and this one's D. So four subnets, two hosts, and three routers. Let's first create the routing tables. The process of routing in the internet protocol, there's different routing protocols that can be in use. And you can think that they are operating always. They're always updating the routing tables. That is, the routing protocols are working to find out what are the least cost paths from any host to any, or from any network to any other network, and creating the routing tables. If the network topology changes, the routing tables will update, reflect that change, and the routing tables will update. So instead of going through how we calculate least cost path, because you know how to do that, let's just draw some routing tables for some of these devices. 
and we'll draw them simply as okay the destination and the next node in the path to reach that destination or the next hop destination next node next hop for host one the routing table what can we what entries do we need for host one Expect quizzes every week from now on. We only have two or three weeks left. Simple quiz question. Draw the routing table for host one. What would you write in the routing table? Destination. So we need, for host one, let's assume we want to reach any, uh, all right, let's make it a little bit uh, more complex than what we have here. Let's assume on these subnets there are many hosts, potentially. I'm just not going to draw them all. That is, there may be other hosts attached to these subnets. Host one, uh, host three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there may be many hosts attached to these subnets. And similar on this subnet. So in general we can say host1, if it wants to reach anyone on the subnet that it's directly attached to, it doesn't have to send to another router. It can send direct to that destination. So there are different ways we could write it, but we could say, okay, destination, if the destination is on subnet A, then send direct. I'll just write direct. If there's another host here, host 5, it's on the same subnet as host 1. In fact, we don't need to send to a router, we can send direct to that host. We don't need, we don't need to use intermediate devices, we have a direct connection via that subnet. So to reach anyone on this subnet, send direct. What about someone on this subnet? Well, the least cost path, there's only one path. This path to send to R1. If you want to reach anyone on subnet B, send to R1. Similar, if you want to reach anyone on subnet C, also send to R1. And R1 will send to R2. If you want to reach anyone on subnet D, host 1 should send to R1. So we can simplify all of those entries as a default route. Where st star means if we read the rows row by row, we do some matching. If the destination matches this subnet, A, send direct. If not, then any other value we will send to R1. So this says send direct if the destination is on subnet A, otherwise send to R1. And then R1 will deliver to the other, the rest of the path. Routing table for R1. Same concepts. If R1 wants to reach anyone on this subnet, subnet A, then send direct. That is, a host here, host 1, is directly attached to the same subnet. R1 is also attached to subnet B. It's connected to two subnets, so it's the same. What about subnet C? If you want to see, reach subnet C, who does R1 send to? R1 will send to... To reach subnet C, R1 will send to R2. And to reach subnet D, R1 would also send to R2. To reach any other subnet, Send to R2.
If the destination is A, send direct. If it, otherwise, if it's B, send direct. Otherwise, send to R2. And we could go through and do that for all the routers. R2 is directly attached to B and C. What else can we do for R2? Router 2 wants to reach subnet D. Router 2 wants to reach subnet D. Who will router 2 send to? R3. R3. And if it wants to reach subnet A, it will send to? If R2 wants to reach subnet A, the first subnet, it was router, router 1. If this wants to reach this subnet, send to R3. And to reach this subnet, send to R1. I've run out of space again. And D. R3. D. Direct. C. Direct. Anyone else? R2. And host 2 will be similar to host 1. Destination on subnet D, direct. Any other subnet, A, B, or C, send to R3. We could have done this one differently if we knew that there was only one subnet. This could have been star, but there's only one subnet D here. Both will work. So there are our five routing tables for the devices. They would be created by some routing protocol that's running, and if something changes in the network, they'll be updated. If we have more routers, Uh, let's let's introduce one more router. Where? Let's try something different and introduce just briefly a router here and some hosts. So this is subnet E and subnet F. Then we'd need extra rows. For example, from R1's perspective, nothing would change. From R1's perspective, to reach C, E, D, F, always go to R2. From R2's perspective, B and C direct, A to R1, here we'd have star. Everyone else, to reach E, D, and F, we'd send to R3. So this would be star if we introduce this router. I will not change the routing tables because we'll need them later. From R3's perspective, C, D, and E would be direct. It's directly attached to three subnets. F would be, so we need F, send to R4, star, R2. That is, anyone else, send to R2. So we'd need extra row here to say that to reach subnet F, send to R4. So as we add more routers, the tables will become more complex, more entries, but it can handle any scenario. So these routing tables are created, and then IP uses them to deliver the data. So let's just get rid of this one just to make our example simpler. These routing tables are created. Now our host wants to send data to the destination. So here's our host, our source host. What we're going to do is go through the steps that the host and the routers take to deliver that data to the destination. This diagram, two slides on, gives a, a flow diagram of the steps 
that a host and a router takes. We're going to go through them. We won't, I won't flick back to this diagram, but it has a, uh, a more precise description of the steps we're about to take. We'll do it on the board. So, we have some data at source A, or actually our source is H1. The application has some data. That is, I've pressed a button on my application and it wants to send data. We assume that it knows the address of the node that it wants to send data to. So, we assume that from host 1's perspective, it knows its own address. That makes sense. Every node should own, know its own address. Its address is H1. And if I want to send data to some other computer, then we assume it knows the address of that other computer, the destination address. And our example is H2. We want to send from host 1 to host 2. The application protocol goes to work, does any processing it needs to do, sends it the, so the data to the transport protocol, which does its processing. We haven't looked at either of those yet, but does some processing and sends its data to IP. And that's what we're going to focus on. So we have some data. It comes from the transport protocol. So we can look at it from IP's perspective. We've got some data arriving from some transport protocol. And we know that the source is H1 and the destination is H2. On this diagram, it's this block. That is, if this is IP, between the dashed lines. Above is the transport protocol. We get data from the transport protocol. We know the source address, the destination address, and the actual transport protocol that's being used. That arrives from the transport protocol, and then IP goes to work. And we're going to go through these steps of what does IP do now? What does the internet protocol do? It receives the data from the transport protocol as well as this address, these addresses. It receives the source, the destination, and it knows which transport protocol sent the data to it. There are many different transport protocols. As an example, it knows that the transport protocol, in our example, let's say, is TCP, which is identified by the number 6. The first thing IP does, okay, we have some data from an application. Let's create an IP datagram. So we take the data and we attach an IP header. So this header would contain the fields of our datagram, which is on one of our previous slides, and then the data, which came from the transport protocol. There were many different fields. We had the version, the header length, and all those fields. Let's just focus on some of them. We re if you recall, or go back to your slides, one of the fields was called the protocol field. And that simply contains the value of which transport protocol sent us the data. In this example, TCP sent us the data. So the protocol field would have the value 6 to indicate TCP. How do you know that TCP is the number 6? That w It's constant. It's always that. Uh, and there's a set of numbers that different transport protocols have. I do not ask you to remember that. I would give you that, for example, in the exam. The list of transport protocols and their numbers. Other fields in the IP header include the source address and the destination address. And there are others. And of course, the source, in our case, is H1, and the destination is H2. For this example, because we don't know the structure of IP addresses yet, 
I'm just going to use letters or, or these letters and numbers. In fact, it's a 32-bit value with some particular structure. We'll cover that later. Let's just refer to them as H1 and H2. So we create an IP datagram. What we're doing, actually we can leave it here, we're looking at what's happening at host 1 at the start. Application created data, we created an IP datagram within that host. And what we do, as a general approach, we check the destination address. Does the destination address of this datagram match my IP address? My address. So host 1 has address H1. It has a datagram with a destination of H2. They are not the same. That is, does the destination H2 match the current node's address, H1? In this case, no. No, so we move to the next step. Now we use our routing table. We look in the routing table. Is the destination address, H2, in the routing table? Is it? Now this is where we need to know something about the relationship between hosts and subnets. Our routing tables we have simplified. We say subnet A is the destination. But in fact that means any host on subnet A. Host H5, if we had H6. Subnet A here indicates multiple hosts any of the hosts on this subnet. Is H2 on subnet A? Hands up for yes. Okay, everyone's correct. So host 2 is not on subnet A. Host 2 is on subnet D. So in fact, encoded in the addresses, this subnet A and in the destination address, later we're going to see we need some information about which subnet this host is on. We'll see that when we look at IP addresses. But for now we know host 2 is not on subnet A, so we're comparing our datagram. Destination, host 2, does it match this row? No. Move on to the next row. Destination, H2, does it match this row? Yes. Because star means any value now. So destination is H2, matches this row in our routing table so that we know we need to send this IP datagram to R1. So the destination was in the routing table. We find the next hop from the routing table. In our case, the next hop is R1. We find the address of the next hop in the path. And then we send this datagram to that next node. We're going to send the datagram to R1 because our routing table tells us to send to R1. We send it via our data link layer. IP is finished now. That is, we just went through what happens in here. It sends the datagram to the data link layer, whatever it is. Ethernet, wireless LAN, something else. It will go to work and send eventually as bits or as some signals across our link to R1. R1 will receive this datagram and then process it. So in fact this datagram is then sent, we started at H1 and received by R1. It will be sent using the LAN technology that H1 and R1 are attached to. And it could be a different, uh, many different technologies. So we can think of it as a, the data started at the application, sent through IP, eventually sent to router 1. When router 1 receives that IP datagram, it eventually comes back to IP, the IP product or IP inside router 1. When a device receives an IP datagram, it follows 
the steps that we have here. We follow the steps. We have data from the transport protocol. We sent the data out. Router R1 receives a datagram, has a header, has some data. The header fields are the same as here. Nothing has changed in the header. Or these fields at least have not. R1 receives this datagram. And that's shown on this slide at this point. We receive datagram from the lower layer. We do a check. Is the destination the same as my IP address? Is the destination the same as my IP address? No, it's not. What is the destination address? Look at our datagram here. This was sent by the host, H1, and then received by R1. The destination address is H2. We're looking at router R1. It's not the destination. H2 is the destination. So it does not match, therefore we look in the routing table. We have a datagram destined to H2. Check the routing table. And now we're at router R1. Is the destination on subnet A? No. Is destination H2 on subnet B? No, it's not. Is it any other value? Yes, it is. So the routing table tells router R1 a datagram destined to H2 send to R2. Find the next hop in the path, R2, send to R2. Send this datagram on to R2. So this describes the steps that the IP layer takes when it receives a datagram. It either receives a datagram from the application layer or from the data link layer. And the basic approach, you receive a datagram, check whether it's destined to you or not. If not, use the routing table to see who to send it to, who to forward it to next. So R2 is going to receive the datagram. Destination is still H2. It hasn't reached the destination. R2 looks in its routing table. Destination H2 is not on subnet B. It's not on subnet C. It's not on subnet A. It is on subnet D. H2 is on subnet D. Therefore, send this datagram to R3. We'd send to R3. R3 receives the datagram. It's not the destination. Looks in the routing table. Is the destination on subnet D? Yes. When R3 receives our datagram, the destination is H2, we know H2 is on subnet D. This row matches in the routing table. It tells R3, send direct to H2 using your LAN technology. It sends to H2. H2 receives the datagram. H2 receives the datagram. Is the destination equal to my address? Yes, it is. Let's show what H2 does here. We're not going to show H3. If we continue our diagram, our datagram went to R3 and then onto H2.
So I've just drawn the same as what we have over here. R1 sent to R2, R2 sent to R3, eventually R3 sent direct to H2. H2 receives this datagram. It checks the destination. Destination H2, I am H2. Therefore, if the destination matches my address, remove the header. We don't need that anymore. Take the data and send the data up to the transport layer. If we go, we're at H2, the, we've received the datagram IP, we remove the header, send the data to the transport layer, the transport layer will eventually send to the application layer, and we've received the data at our destination host, H2. So that's the way that IP delivers the data through the internet. There are a few details that we've missed, especially related to IP addresses, but we'll co cover them after we go through IP addresses in detail. So a point we see on this diagram only the hosts have drawn the application and transport protocols. The routers I have not. For forwarding, the routers do not need to be involved in the transport or application protocol. There is no... The routers have no knowledge of what the application... Uh, what application is being used. If this is a web browsing application, the routers don't care. All the routers care about is we see, receive an IP datagram, send it to the next router, send it to the next router. It's only the end hosts that care about the application, what application is being used and what application protocol. So we don't need the transport and application layer at the routers. Unless we want to manage and, conf and configure those routers. So we're focusing on this layer. What happens at IP at the, all these devices? Reasonably simple. Receive a datagram. Is it destined to you? Yes, good. Take the data. If no, look in the routing table, send to the next one. And keep doing that until it reaches the destination. And that's how IP works. Or the, the basic approach of the internet protocol and how your data is delivered across the internet. We have a visitor. Any questions? No. no? I'm glad you come back to my lecture. So We'll just talk about two small extensions or two, two small other features of IP and then we'll spend some time looking at how the addresses are structured. We've used these very simple addresses. In fact, the IP addresses have a particular structure and the structure includes information about the host and also the subnet that it's on. So that's IP forwarding. IP routing we know about, we create the routing tables. That's the process for IP forwarding. It may look complex here, but it's reasonably simple from the basic approach. Fragmentation and reassembly. One of the problems in an internet is that different subnets may have maximum, different maximum packet sizes and IP may have to break the datagram into smaller datagrams. If the length of this datagram was 2,000 bytes, but the next subnet only supported frames of 1,000 bytes, then IP would need to fragment this into two datagrams, two smaller datagrams, to fit in the maximum size supported by the subnet. And that's what 
fragmentation and reassembly does. It breaks the, seg the datagrams into smaller fragments, sends the smaller fragments, and reassembles them to get the original datagram at some endpoint. There are different approaches for fragmentation and reassembly. We'll quickly go through some examples and then mention what IP uses. Here we have a simple internet with a host, source host, destination host, two routers, three subnets. Each subnet have a maximum size of frame, maximum amount of data that they will deliver. 2,000 bytes, 1,000 bytes, 8,000 bytes. Our source has 6,000 bytes of data to send. Okay. In the first approach, we fragment at the source and reassemble at the destination. For this approach to work, the source needs to know what is the minimum of the maximum sizes across the path. This has a maximum size of 2,000, 1,000, 8,000. The minimum of those three is 1,000. So what the source does, if it knows that the minimum is 1,000, it takes its 6,000 bytes and fragments into six different pieces, six fragments, and sends those individually across the internet same approach as what we've just used, sends them to router 1, to router 2, eventually router 2 sends the 6 to the destination, and the destination reassembles those fragments into the one original datagram. So we fragment at the source, reassemble at the destination. That's one approach. For this approach to work, the source needed to know the minimum of the maximum sizes supported across each subnet. Another approach. Let's fragment at the source and at routers if needed and reassemble at the destination. In this case, the source still has 6,000 bytes. It only needs to know about the maximum size of the next subnet. The maximum size here is 2,000. We've got 6,000. Break it into three fragments. 2,000, 2,000, 2,000. Send those three. Send to the first router. The router receives the first fragment. It is 2,000 bytes. The maximum size supported across the next subnet is 1,000. So now the router fragments each of these into two fragments. This is 2,000 bytes, divide it into two fragments of 1,000 bytes each. As a result, we'll get six. Each of these three would be divided into two. Sends those to the next router. The router receives fragments each of 1,000 bytes in length. This subnet supports 8,000 bytes. It's less than the maximum, therefore send them. Reassemble at the destination. We receive six fragments, put them back together, we get the original 6,000 bytes. This one is better in terms of the source does not need to know about the maximum segment sizes across each of the subnets. It only needs to know about the next subnet. This one is worse than the first one in that the routers need to do fragmentation, potentially. Here, it's only the source that does fragmentation. Fragmentation takes some CPU time. Last approach. Fragment at the source and at the routers if needed. Reassemble at the routers and at the destination if needed. These two approaches, we only reassemble at the destination. Here, we are allowed to reassemble at the intermediate devices. Source has 6,000 bytes. Segment, uh, the subnet can support 2,000 bytes. Divide into three segments, one, two, three. Send them to the first router. Router reassembles those three 
and get 6,000 bytes. If we join the three together, we get our original 6,000 bytes. And then looks at the next subnet, 1,000 bytes. Okay, we've got 6,000. We need to fragment into six segments. Our six segments here, send them. Router 2 receives the six segments, reassembles, gets 6,000 bytes. This supports 8,000 bytes, so send everything as one datagram, one segment, uh, 6,000 bytes to the destination. Destination doesn't have to do anything. It re receives the, all of the data in one datagram and has successfully, can successfully process the data. This one is better in terms that we're more efficient in using the maximum segment size. Maximum seg segment size 2,000, we send 2,000 bytes. Here 1,000, we send 1,000 bytes. Here 8,000, we send 6,000. The larger our datagram, the more efficient we are because the lower the header. As opposed in this one, over the third subnet, the maximum supported was 8,000, but we only sent segments of 1,000. That's less efficient because we have more header. We have six headers here. Here we just have one. So that's where this one, this one is better than this and the previous one. This one is worse than the others in that we need to both fragment and reassemble at the routers. That adds complexity, takes time. Three different approaches to fragmentation and reassembly. The internet protocol uses the middle approach. It's a trade-off between not having to know about the entire path. This one we need to know about the entire path to know that the minimum of the maximum sizes is 1,000. This one we do not. That's good. This one we can send reasonable size or we reasonably efficient except in the last subnet. IP uses this approach. Fragment at the source and routers if needed. Reassemble only at the destination. Quiz question next week. Here are the three approaches. What are the advantages of them? What are the disadvantages? Or which one does IP use? So understand the difference between those three. We've gone through reasonably quickly, but I think you can look in your own time and see how each of them work. IP uses option two, the second one in that previous one. Some example of how IP does that with the headers, but we're not going to look at that in any detail. That's too much for our course. Last concept with IP. We in the header, there's a time to live field. When we send a datagram, when we create it, we set the time to live field to a particular value. Let's give it a value. Time to live. Let's say we set it to 10 at the source. This is like our hop limit in flooding. We send it across one hop to the first router. That first router will reduce it to 9 and send it to the next router which will reduce it to 8 and send it to the next router. Once it gets to 0, a router will not send it any further. That is, it's removed from the, the internet. So it indicates the number of hops that that datagram will traverse through the internet. Useful if there's an error in the network. Maybe there's an error such that you send to router 1, router 1 sends, or router 1 se then sends to router 2, router 2 sends back to router 1, router 1 sends to router 2, to router 1, and we go in a circle forever. If we didn't have a time to live, that datagram would kept being transmitted between the two routers. 
by introducing the time to live, eventually this will decrease to zero and it will no longer be sent. So it is a way to deal with making sure datagrams are not transmitted forever. And that's it about the, the basics of how IP works. Now we want to look at how IP addresses are structured. Let's look at an example IP address first. Again, the same as when we found our hardware address, our MAC address, on our interface, we had normally assigned an IP address as well. My wireless LAN interface, because I'm connected to WSIT, the wireless network, I have an IP address. It's listed here as an INET, an internet address. 10.10.99.251. So you've seen these IP addresses on your computer before. We're going to explain what it means, what the structure it is, and how it's obtained. We also see other IP addresses, 10.10.103.255, 255, 255.255.248.0. So these are all IP, IP version 4 addresses. We said there's a newer version, IP version 6. My device also has an IP version 6 address, an Internet 6 address. It's this long string here with hexadecimal digits. We're not going to explain how that's structured. That's part of IPv6. So we're going to explain what does 101099.251 mean and how is it ob obtained. First, all IP addresses, all IP version 4 addresses, which we're assuming, are 32 bits in length. Are a binary value, 32 bits. Recall back to the IP header, the source and destination fields were 32 bits in length, enough to fit the address. So they're not letters and numbers, they're 32-bit values. We think of those 32 bits to represent two pieces of information. Part of a selection of those bits represent the network or the subnet that the device is attached to and another selection of bits represent the host, that is what is this device. Recall that H2 was attached to subnet D. In the IP address of H2 we include both of those identifying information. That is, we include something that indicates that this host is attached to subnet D and the host is H2. So we can talk about those 32 bits as split into two parts or two portions. The portion that identifies the subnet or the network and the portion that identifies the host within that subnet or network. Normally it's split uh, that is the first n bits represent the subnet or the network portion the last h bits identify the device within that subnet So in our case we have subnet D and on subnet D is H2 and so although it's not an IP address that's the way we can think of the address for this device, this host. It ident this address identifies the subnet and the host within that subnet. Similar this would be a H1. 
It's on subnet A. It is host H1. If we have another host attached here, H1, its address would be D H1. Every host on subnet D in its address needs the same network portion, D in this simple example. Every host portion inside this subnet must be unique. H1 must be different from H2. But H1 doesn't have to be different from H1 here. Because it's on a different subnet, it can be the same. And every subnet in our internet needs to have a unique subnet address, A, B, C, and D. We cannot have, a, we cannot have two subnets which are called D. That's not allowed. So all subnets need unique addresses. All hosts within a subnet you need, need unique host addresses. And the IP address is made up from combining the subnet address and the host address. It's not letters and numbers, it's in fact a 32-bit value. So if we drew that as bit 1, bit 2, up to bit 32, so it's a 32-bit value, some of those bits indicate the subnet, or simply the network, and the remaining bits indicate the host. That's similar to what we did in the example. The first part indicates the subnet, the second part the host within that subnet. That's what all IP addresses, that's how all IP addresses are structured. All subnets in the internet have a unique network portion. All subnets, all different subnets must have a different network portion. All IP devices in a subnet have the same network portion. These two devices have the same network portion, D. The router is also an IP device and also has an IP address. So we could call this router DR3 because this router is attached to subnet D, so the two hosts, and where R3 is the host portion of the address. Where do we split? We have 32 bits. Some of the bits indicate the network, some represent the host. There are different locations that we can split to have some bits represent the network and the host. And in fact, there have been different schemes over uh, the last 30 years for where do you split between the network and the host portion. Some of those schemes have been referred to initially as classful addresses, where we had five different classes, and then subnet addressing, and eventually classless addressing. In this course, we're going to focus on classless addressing, which is what is used now. We'll mention a little bit about classful addressing, because it's sometimes referred to as well. Look at my IP address again, 10.10.99.251. But we've said an IP address is 32 bits. It doesn't look like a 32-bit number. The same with our hardware address. Remember, our hardware address is a 48-bit number, but we write it as hexadecimal digits. It's a little bit easier for humans to deal with. We do the same with IP addresses. It's actually a 32-bit number, but we convert it into decimal values separated by dots, so it's easier for humans to deal with. And it's called the dotted decimal notation. For the last few minutes, let's go through how that dotted decimal notation works. How do we represent IP version 4 addresses.
and then we'll return to the split between the network and the host portion and how that's performed. But first, every IP address is 32 bits. Dealing with bits for humans is not so easy, so we convert it into decimal values. So the approach is we split it into four parts, so we take eight bits at a time, that is one byte. We have 32 bits, we divide it into four parts of eight bits. We convert each eight bit value into a decimal value, and then we separate those decimal values by dots, and we get the resulting dotted decimal notation of the address. Example, here's our IP address. 32 bits. First, we divide it into four parts of equal length. So I'll write it down again. What do we get? One, one. One followed by six, two ones followed by six values. That's the first eight bits. The next eight bits is one, 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 zero, one. And the third eight bits, if I can get this. Have I? Maybe that's not correct. First eight bits, second eight bits. We've got too many. Here. And zero, zero, one. Okay. We need another zero at the front. And the last eight bits. So just split those 32 bits into four pieces of eight bits each. Now, convert each of them into decimal numbers. What's the first one? 192. Remember the decimal numbers, the first value, if it's a one, represents one, two, four, eight. So in fact, this one is 128 plus 164, uh, plus 64, which is 192. This one is 128 plus 64, 192 plus 32, which is 224 plus 4. This one is 16 plus 1. This one is 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 129. You can use your calculator to do conversions from binary to decimal. That's not the point here. We just convert each 8-bit value into a decimal value. Last one. Sorry. Which one? Last one, yeah, is 32 plus 16, yeah, 48, 57. Good. So you and I will use my calculator in the future. And then we combine them together but separate by dots. There's the human readable form of this IP address. This is the computer readable form. This is what's sent in the IP datagram. This is what's stored in the routing tables. But for us humans to enter the values into a computer, we can use this form. And there'll be some function that converts between this and this within the software. So you need to know how to convert from a 32-bit value into a dotted decimal notation, and back, so in any direction. All of our IP addresses that we refer to, we can convert like this, in either direction.
what we'll do next week is we'll talk how do we split, where do we split to identify the network and the host. So somewhere in these 32 bits, we're going to split where some of the bits, the first set of bits identify a network, the last set of bits identify a host within that network. To, so we get this concept of some bits represent the network, some the host. We'll explain the approach for that next week. Enough for today.